Chapters twenty one and twenty two of Book eight of Les Miserables, Volume three by Victor Hugo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by May Lowe. Les Miserables, Volume three by Victor Hugo. Translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood. Book eight. The Wicked Poor Man. Chapter twenty one. One should always begin by arresting the victims. At nightfall, Javert had posted his men and had gone into ambush himself between the trees of the Rue de la Berriere des Gobelins, which faced the Gorbeau house on the other side of the boulevard. He had begun operations by opening his pockets and dropping into it the two young girls who were charged with keeping a watch on the approaches to the den. But he had only caged Azelma. As for Eponine, she was not at her post, she had disappeared, and he had not been able to seize her. Then Javert had made a point, and had bent his ear to waiting for the signal agreed upon. The comings and goings of the fiacres had greatly agitated him. At last he had grown impatient, and, sure that there was a nest there, sure of being in luck, having recognised many of the ruffians who had entered, he had finally decided to go upstairs without waiting for the pistol shot. It will be remembered that he had Marius's pass-key. He had arrived just in the nick of time. The terrified ruffians flung themselves on the arms which they had abandoned in all the corners at the moment of flight. In less than a second, these seven men, horrible to behold, had grouped themselves in an attitude of defence, one with his meat-axe, another with his key, another with his bludgeon, the rest with shears, pincers, and hammers. Thenardier had his knife in his fist. The Thenardier woman snatched up an enormous paving-stone, which lay in the angle of the window, and served her daughters as an ottoman. Javert put on his hat again, and advanced a couple of paces into the room, with arms folded, his cane under one arm, his sword in its sheath. "'Halt there!' said he. "'You shall not go out by the window. You shall go through the door. It's less unhealthy. There are seven of you. There are fifteen of us. Don't let's fall to collaring each other like men of Auvergne.' Bigrenet drew out a pistol which he had kept concealed under his blouse and put it in Thénardier's hand, whispering in the latter's ear, "'It's Javert! I don't dare fire at that man. Do you dare?' "'Parbleu!' replied Thénardier. "'Well, then, fire!' Thénardier took the pistol and aimed at Javert. Javert, who was only three paces from him, stared intently at him and contented himself with saying, "'Come now, don't fire!' You'll miss fire. Thénardier pulled the trigger. The pistol missed fire. Didn't I tell you so? ejaculated Javert. Bigrenet flung his bludgeon at Javert's feet. You're the emperor of the fiends. I surrender. And you? Javert asked the rest of the ruffians. They replied, So do we. Javert began again calmly. That's right, that's good. I said so. You are nice fellows. I only ask one thing, said Bigrenet, and that is, that I might not be denied tobacco while I am in confinement. Granted, said Chevert, and turning round and calling behind him, Come in now! A squad of policemen, sword in hand, and agents armed with bludgeons and cudgels, rushed in at Chevert's summons. They pinioned the ruffians. This throng of men, sparely lighted by the single candle, filled the den with shadows. "'Handcuff them all!' shouted Javert. "'Come on!' cried a voice, which was not the voice of a man, but of which no one would have ever said, "'It is a woman's voice.' The Thénardier woman had entrenched herself in one of the angles of the window, and it was she who had just given vent to this roar. The policemen and agents recoiled. She had thrown off her shawl, but retained her bonnet. Her husband, who was crouching behind her, was almost hidden under the discarded shawl, 
and she was shielding him with her body, as she elevated the paving stone above her head with the gesture of a giantess on the point of hurling a rock. Beware! she shouted. All crowded back towards the corridor. A broad open space was cleared in the middle of the garret. The Thénardier woman cast a glance at the ruffians, who had allowed themselves to be pinioned, and muttered in hoarse and guttural accents, The cowards! Javert smiled, and advanced across the open space which the Thénardier was devouring with her eyes. Don't come near me, she cried, or I'll crush you. What a grenadier, ejaculated Javert. You've got a beard like a man, mother, but I have claws like a woman. And he continued to advance. The Thénardier, dishevelled and terrible, set her feet far apart, threw herself backwards, and hurled the paving stone at Javert's head. Javert ducked, the stone passed over him, struck the wall behind, knocked off a huge piece of plastering, and, rebounding from angle to angle across the hovel, now luckily almost empty, rested at Javert's feet. At the same moment Javert reached the Thénardier couple. One of his big hands descended on the woman's shoulder, the other on the husband's head. "'The handcuffs!' he shouted. The policeman trooped in in force, and in a few seconds Javert's order had been executed. The Thénardier female, overwhelmed, stared at her pinioned hands, and at those of her husband, who had dropped to the floor, and exclaimed, weeping, "'My daughters!' "'They are in the jug,' said Javert. In the meanwhile, the agents had caught sight of the drunken man asleep behind the door, and were shaking him. He awoke, stammering, "'Is it all over, Jondrette?' "'Yes,' replied Javert. The six pinioned ruffians were standing, and still preserved their spectral mien. All three besmeared with black, all three masked. "'Keep on your masks,' said Javert, and, passing them in review, with a glance of a Frederick the Second at a Potsdam parade, he said to the three chimney-builders, "'Good day, Big René. Good day, Brujon. Good day, De Milliard.' Then turning to the three masked men, he said to the man with the meat axe, Good day, Grelmer, and to the man with the cudgel, Good day, Babet, and to the ventriloquist, Your health, Claxu. At that moment he caught sight of the ruffian's prisoner, who, ever since the entrance of the police, had not uttered a word and had held his head down. Untie the gentleman, said Javert, and let no one go out. That said, he seated himself with sovereign dignity before the table, where the candle and the writing materials still remained, drew a stamped paper from his pocket, and began to prepare his report. When he had written the first lines, which are formulas that never vary, he raised his eyes. Let the gentleman whom these gentlemen bound step forward. The policeman glanced round them. Well, Sir Javert, where is he? The prisoner of the ruffians, M. Leblanc, M. Urbain Fabre, the father of Ursule, or the Lark, had disappeared. The door was guarded, but the window was not. As soon as he had found himself released from his bonds, and while Javert was drawing up his report, he had taken advantage of confusion, the crowd, the darkness, and of a moment when the general attention was diverted from him, to dash out of the window. An agent sprang to the opening and looked out. He saw no one outside. The rope ladder was still shaking. "'The devil!' ejaculated Javert between his teeth. "'He must have been the most valuable of the lot!' Chapter 22 The Little One Who Was Crying in Volume 2 On the day following that on which these events took place, in the house on the boulevard de l'Hôpital, a child, who seemed to be coming from the direction of the bridge of Austerlitz, was ascending the side alley on the right in the direction of the Barriere du Fontainebleau. Night had fully come. This lad was pale, thin, clad in rags, with linen trousers in the month of February, and was singing at the top of his voice. 
At the corner of the Rue du Petit Banquier, a bent old woman was rummaging in a heap of refuse by the light of a street lantern. The child jostled her as he passed, then recoiled, exclaiming, Hello, and I took it for an enormous, enormous dog. He pronounced the word enormous the second time, with a jeering swell of the voice, which might be tolerably well represented by capitals, an enormous, enormous dog. The old woman straightened herself up in a fury. Nasty brat, she grumbled. If I hadn't been bending over, I know well where I would have planted my foot on you. The boy was already far away. Kiss, kiss, he cried. After that, I don't think I was mistaken. The old woman, choking with indignation, now rose completely upright, and the red gleam of the lantern fully lighted up her livid face, all hollowed into angles and wrinkles, with crow's feet meeting the corners of her mouth. Her body was lost in the darkness, and only her head was visible. One would have pronounced her a mask of decrepitude carved out by a light from the night. The boy surveyed her. Madame, said he, does not possess that style of beauty which pleases me. He then pursued his road, and resumed his song. Le roi coup des abos s'en allait à la chasse, à la chasse au corbeau. At the end of these three lines he paused. He had arrived in front of numbers fifty to fifty-two, and finding the door fastened, he began to assault it with resounding and heroic kicks which betrayed rather the man's shoes that he was wearing than the child's feet which he owned. In the meanwhile, the very old woman whom he had encountered at the corner of the Rue du Petit Vanquier hastened up behind him, uttering clamorous cries and indulging in lavish and exaggerated gestures. "'What's this? What's this? Lord God! He's battering the door down! He's knocking the house down!' The kicks continued. The old woman strained her lungs. Is that the way buildings are treated nowadays? All at once she paused. She had recognized the gammon. What? So it's that imp. Why, it's the old lady, said the lad. Good day, Bougonmouche. I have come to see my ancestors. The old woman retorted with a composite grimace and a wonderful improvisation of hatred taking advantage of feebleness and ugliness, which was, unfortunately, wasted in the dark. "'There's no one here.' "'Bah!' retorted the boy. "'Where's my father?' "'At La Force.' "'Come now. And my mother?' "'At Saint-Lazare.' "'Well, and my sisters?' "'At the Madelonettes.' The lad scratched his head behind his ear, stared at Mame Bougon, and said, Ah! Then he executed a pirouette on his heel. A moment later the old woman, who had remained on the doorstep, heard him singing in his clear young voice as he plunged under the black elm trees in the wintry wind. Le roi coup des abos s'en allait à la chasse, à la chasse au corbeau, monsieur du à chasse, quand on passait dessus, on lui paye dessus. End of Book Eight, Chapters Twenty One and Twenty Two. End of Les Misérables, Volume Three by Victor Hugo. Translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood.